third video for chapter three, excuse me, chapter five. This is the final video for the chapter. So today I'm going to cover some topics. I'm going to work a uniform flow problem. I'm going to work another type of a steady flow problem, which is a turbine. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about one uh, thermodynamic relationship. So having said that, let's go over here to the document camera or to the, I'm sorry, to the podium PC first. This is from our Moodle page. You'll see that we've posted the chapter five video one, the chapter five video two. I've also posted the notes that went along with video two, and I've uh, posted a complete list of the homework problems. So after our lecture today, which will be chapter five video three, uh, you'll have all the information you knew, need in order to do your homework. And on the next class meeting, the next video we'll have will be chapter six video one. All right, so having said that, we're going to go over here to the document cam, and there are, uh, there is a, there are two problems that I want to work today. Um, I did problem, just one moment, I did problem 530 in class, uh, which was a nozzle, and a nozzle is a steady flow apparatus, so we use steady flow analysis on that. Uh, the purpose of a nozzle is to change the pressure and velocity of a fluid from a, a larger entrance to a smaller exit, uh, but there is no work done. The work or um, rate of work or power are equal to zero because the function of a nozzle is the change in pressure. The opposite of a nozzle, which I will not uh, do, but just to explain, is called a diffuser, and it's the same sort of a thing, except you could turn the nozzle over and you would have a diffuser. So you change the pressure and velocity of the fluid, uh, but you do not, uh, but in this case, you're slowing it down rather than speeding it up. But in any case, the power and the work associated with diffusers are still equal to zero. Now your author in the textbook show you many other examples of steady flow problems, but the one that I want to work today is a turbine. And a turbine is, in general, a steady flow apparatus. But the purpose of a turbine is to do work or to generate power. So one of the applications for a turbine that we often see uh, is at the base of a waterfall or at the base of a dam. And as you know, a lot of power in the world is generated by hydro, it's called hydroelectric. Basically what we're doing is we're taking water, a potential difference, this is a potential energy, and turning it into electrical power. And a turbine does that um, by a winding, by putting a, something that will generate electricity using the Faraday effect inside of it and generating electrical power. So in many parts of the world, Hydro is the primary source of power. In the United States, it's a major source of power, but it is not necessarily the primary source of power. There was an environmentalist movement in the mid-1960s that sort of shut down a lot of dam building. So most of the dam building in the, in the world is being done in countries other than the United States. But hydro is a great source of electrical power and still very, very important. Uh, it's important here, but in Canada, for example, they just call power hydro because it's basically all hydroelectric. Um, the northwestern United States also generates a surplus of power from some of the big dams, uh, Grand Coulee being the biggest. Um, in the southwest, there is the dam at Boulder City, which is called Hoover Dam, which is another huge one. Um, and then there's a bunch, of, there's a number of other huge reclamation projects. Here in the Bighorn Basin, Buffalo Bill Dam was actually built for agriculture in the early part of the 1900s, like 1903. Uh, they generated electricity during the building of the dam to complete the building of the dam, uh, but then they shut power down for many years because there was really no need for it here, which is just bizarre to think about in today's, uh, in today's world. But back when rural electrification came through, um, Buffalo Bill started producing power again. And so we're now, for many years, for 100 years, we've been producing power from Buffalo Bill Dam. All right, so I think um, the, now let's talk about this. So a turbine, the purpose is to generate power. Another type of a steady flow, um, an, another type of a steady flow device is a compressor. 
and the purpose of a compressor is to change the pressure or to, uh, well, they can change the state. Like if you have a two-phase uh, fluid, compress it into a liquid or to take a liquid or a gas and compress it further. Um, so compressors are very important um, industrial uh, appliances. One place that you have one in your house, if you have a refrigeration system, if you have a refrigerator or a freezer or a air conditioner, they, they require phase changes that we'll learn about a little bit later on that all require compressors. So compressors are very important industrial applications. But the problem I'd like to do today is, is with a turbine, just because um, I think they're kind of cool. So let's look at problem 546. And we will work through this problem. And uh, they're also sort of like when we talk about closed systems. I said that a piston cylinder is sort of a classical thermodynamic problem. A turbine is a classical uh, thermodynamic problem for a steady flow problem. So 546 says that we have steam that flows steadily through an adiabatic turbine. This brings up the first point. Adiabatic means Q net, in other words, the heat lost or gained is equal to zero, and therefore Q dot net is also equal to zero. So turbines approximate uh, being adiabatic, generally speaking. So that means that when we start writing the first law, that the Q term will be eliminated from the equation. All right. Steam flows steadily through an adiabatic turbine. The inlet condition of the steam uh, are 4 MPa and uh, 500 degrees centigrade. Um, and the velocity of the steam going in is 80 meters per second. This is sort of a clue that we're not going to get to dismiss kinetic energy because velocity is associated with kinetic energy. The exit conditions of our turbine, and sort of the stylistic or stick figure version of a turbine looks like this with a shaft shown as turning. All that means is that you're getting power out of the turbine. And that's sort of like the stylistic representation. So I have steam going in at these conditions, and we have steam coming out at a different set of conditions. The pressure is 30 kPa. The steam quality coming out is 92%. So there's 8% of the mass is liquid at this point. And the velocity here, they're calling it 2, but I'm just going to call it I'm just going to leave the subscripts off for a minute and I'll explain why, is 50 meters per second. So once again, we're not going to be able to ignore the change in kinetic energy. Um, the mass flow rate of steam is 12 kilograms per second. That also indicates, it just tells us mass flow because the mass flow in is equal to the mass flow out. Turbines don't accumulate mass or discharge mass. So the mass is the same uh, throughout the, the amount of mass or the mass is the same, so therefore the mass flow rate is the same. Determine the change in kinetic energy. Okay. Uh, the power output um, and the turbine inlet area. All right, so when you look at those questions, when you look at the setup and you look at the questions, we sort of, you may not instantly recognize that this is a first law slash um, material balance or conservation of mass problem, but it is. So trusting in that idea, let's write the first law of thermodynamics for a control volume. Now the good news is we don't really have to do a mass balance because since it's a turbine, dmcvdt, the change in mass in the control volume with respect to time is equal to zero. We have one inlet and one outlet. So that means that the mass flow rate in is equal to the mass flow rate out and we're actually given that quantity in the problem. 
So that simplifies this quite a bit. Uh, referring to page 251 in my textbook, there is a good, uh, a, a good version of the first law of thermodynamics for a steady flow problem. So I'll write it out completely. And then we'll eliminate terms that are not um, applicable in this problem. All right. First of all, we're told that the problem is adiabatic. That means that my rate of heat transfer is equal to zero. We have one inlet and one outlet, so there's no summations involved. We do have enthalpy associated with the inlet stream and the outlet stream. We definitely have velocity because we're given those numbers, but there's no particular change in elevation. Now, it's important to note there's no particular change in elevation between the inlet and the exit of the turbine. All of this energy really came from the potential energy. If, the, if this turbine were at the bottom of the dam, it comes from the potential energy of the water as it moves from the higher elevation to the lower elevation. But that is um, when we draw our free body diagram or, or our system diagram of the turbine, everything that started out as elevation has turned into kinetic energy at this point. Right. So when we rewrite this equation, we get minus W dot equals M dot in and out are the same times H, this would be on my outlet, which I call exit, plus V on exit squared over 2 minus H on the inlet plus V on the inlet squared over 2. And in our work together, we have identified um, what's going on with the units here, but we'll go through that again as well. All right, we have M dot. We can find uh, H dot, and uh, we have VE dot. So if we can resolve, and we can find HI dot. So all we have to do is take these inlet conditions and get our H sub I and our H sub E values. And then we'll have everything we need to find the work output by this turbine. So coming back over to the podium PC, I'm going to go to my property tables up at the top of the Moodle page. Or if you have your textbook, you can use that as well. We are in SI units, and we're talking about steam. So we go to the table for water. It's superheated in one case, and it is 92% uh, quality steam in the on the exit. So the first thing we can look at, since I'm in the two-phase or the saturated um, water temperature table, I know that my pressure on my exit is 30 kPa. And so, oops, my data is right here, isn't it? All right. So I don't really need this, but I find then that my 30 kPa, since I have 92% quality steam, that means that my temperature has to be uh, 69.09 degrees centigrade. So you can see, first of all, we've lost quite a bit of temperature, which is the point. We've lost that to uh, work. And then I need to find my H sub E value. And I know you can't see this right now, but I'm going to write this out. That's going to be H sub F plus X times H sub F G. If I look at my table, my H sub F value is 289.27. My X value is 0.92, and my H sub FG is 2335.3, 2335.3. Okay, and my units would be kilojoules per kilogram. Now I'll switch back over to my work on the document cam so you can take a look at that. And here it is. I just plugged in those values that I just got from the tables, um, and I'll be able to determine my H sub E value. So using a calculator then, I take 0.92, which is my steam quality, multiply it by H sub FG, which is 2335.3. .3. 
and then I add that to my H sub F value, 289.27. And my H sub E value is 2437.746 or 0.75. And my units, of course, are kilojoules per kilogram. Now, <coughs> up here I have superheated steam. So I need to find my H sub I value in the superheated steam tables. So I come down here to where I get my little tablets for superheated steam. They're organized by pressure. My pressure is 4 MPA, which is a lot of pressure right here, 4 MPA. Um, and the temperature is 500 degrees centigrade. So there's my data right there. And my H value is 3446.0 kilojoules per kilogram. OK. Now, um, I want to do one other piece of information. I'll explain this in a minute. I also want to write the specific volume on the inlet, which is 0 0.08644. And those are in units of cubic meter per kilogram. Okay, So those are the two values that I just plucked out of the table. So the first thing that I want to do is to find the change in kinetic energy. We don't really need much data for that. We're just given the velocities. So delta Ke, if we write it as an intensive property, is uh, V on the exit squared over 2 minus V on the entrance squared over 2. Okay, that's just a definition of kinetic energy or of a, de of a delta difference. My velocity on exit is 50 meters per second, quantity squared, divided by 2 over my V sub I. 80 meters per second squared over 2. So my delta Ke for this problem, if I take uh, 50 and square it, I get 2,500. 80 squared, 6,400 meters squared per second squared. I have to divide by 2. Okay. So if I take those two numbers, um, 2,500 zero, zero minus 6,400 divided by 2. I get a value of negative 1,950 meters squared per second squared. Okay, meters squared per second squared is not an acceptable unit for energy, right? So what I do is I have to take, what does energy look like? Energy units should be kilojoules per kilogram in the SI system. So if I start with a kilojoule, we've already done this, but I'm doing it again. We have 10 to the third joules, which is a newton meter per kilogram, right? So um, then if I use Newton's second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration. It's a newton is e equal to a kilogram meter per second squared. So if I substitute that here, kilogram meter times meter over kilogram second squared, I get that cancels out and I get meter squared per second squared. So that means therefore one kilojoule per kilogram is equal to a thousand meters squared per second squared. All right. So if I take minus 1950 meters squared per second squared and I use a unit conversion factor of 10 to the third meter squared per second squared per kilojoule per kilogram. This cancels. I should put delta Ke equals. And so this is this divided by 1,000, 1, 2, 3, negative 1 1.95 kilojoules per kilogram is the change in kinetic energy um, from the inlet to the outlet. So what does the negative mean? Well, it just means it's slowed down, right? I mean, so we started out with a higher energy than we, a higher kinetic energy 
than we ended up with. The other thing that we've done here, though, is we've identified the conversion factor, which we're going to need again, perhaps, in our equation. We can see what, if that works out. The next thing that we want to do, then, is to get our power out. Okay? So the equation that we use is this one. So I get negative W dot equals M dot, which is 12 kilograms per second, times HE minus HI, first of all. Okay? Well, I already kind of know what that is, right? Well, no, I'm sorry, VE minus v, VE squared over 2 minus VI squared over 2. That is my delta KE, isn't it? So in other words, I can say M dot times HE minus HI plus VE um, over 2 delta KE. So far, so good? I already have this value, which is negative 1.95 kilojoules per kilogram. My HE value, I calculated up here. as 2437.75 kilojoules per kilogram minus my HI, which is 3446 kilojoules per kilogram. So I have this minus this minus that all in kilojoules per kilogram, which is a big old Yahoo. Kilograms cancel out, I get kilojoules per second. Kilojoule per second is a kilowatt, okay? So if I go ahead and I do this calculation, I have negative uh, 1.95, I have negative 3446, and I have a positive 2437.75. So this entire answer comes out to be a negative number, negative 1010. I multiply that by 12, and I get uh, negative 12122.4 kilowatts. Okay, that's equal to negative work, right? So if I multiply through by negative 1, I get the work output is 12122.4 kilowatts which is 12.1 megawatts, okay? <clears throat> so that is a sizable turbine. Yep. All right, so now the next part is the last question, what is the area on the inlet? Well, we need to do a little bit of geometric analysis. Hang on. I guess I get to use the gray paper, because that's what I have. All right. We know that mass flow rate is equal to volumetric flow rate times little v, or I've got this backward. So volumetric flow rate would be, for example, in meters cubed per second, uh, little v so does over V, uh, over meters cubed per kilogram would give me kilogram per second, which is a good unit for mass flow rate. All right? Um, we further know that if we take volumetric flow rate, so in other words, let me go ahead and solve this. Mass flow rate times little V then is equal to volumetric flow rate. All right. So what that says is this is going to be in cubic meters per second, okay? If I take cubic meters per second and divide it by the cross-sectional area on the inlet, uh, this value is going to be in meters squared, and so that would give me meters per second, which is velocity, all right? So in other words, velocity times the cross-sectional area on the inlet is equal to the volumetric flow rate, okay? And volumetric flow rate, in turn, is equal to mass flow rate times specific volume. 
So if this is what I'm looking for, I can use the transitive property to just say if this is equal to this and this is equal to this, that this is also equal to this, that's equal to mass flow rate times specific volume divided by velocity. Okay, so my mass flow rate is 12 kilograms per second. My specific volume, which I pulled out of the table, is 0 0.08644 cubic meters per second. And my velocity on the inlet is 80 meters per second. And I've missed something here. Um, this is not, this is the wrong unit. It's cubic meters per kilogram. Because that's specific volume. Okay? So this cancels this. This cancels this. Meter cancels against one of those. And I'm left with square meters. Which is a good unit for cross-sectional area. So the numeric value is uh, 12 times 0 0.08644 divided by 80. And that value is 0 0.013 square meters. Okay. So we have all three of our answers that were required in the problem. We have a delta KE. We have the work out. And we have the cross-sectional area of the inlet. Now, they don't ask this, but we could also find the cross-sectional area on the exit, couldn't we, if we, had, if we calculated specific volume on the exit? Because the mass flow rate is the same. Um, and then if we had a little v um, and we have the velocity, we could calculate that. But that's not asked for in this problem. All right. Do you guys have any questions at this point? All right, so the next problem that I would like to do is a mixing chamber problem. And the problem number is uh, 574. Okay. All right, so in your textbook, 574 says, a stream of refrigerant at 1 MPa and 20 degrees centigrade is mixed with another stream at 1 MPa and 80 degrees centigrade. If the mass flow rate of the cold stream is twice that of the hot one, determine the temperature and quality of the exit stream. Okay, so here's what we have. We have some kind of a box. And we have a mass in, we're going to call it mass in one, and mass in two. So in other words, we have two mass flow rates in, and we have a single mass flow rate out. Uh, so the fir first of all, we're dealing with refrigerant R134A. And refrigerant is a general term. Refrigerant can refer to any refrigerant. So they specify that it's 134A. But if it's not specified in our book, that's the only refrigerant that we really have tables for. So it's sort of a safe assumption. But technically, to be correct, you need to specify. OK. So this one has a pressure of 1 MPa and a temperature of 20 degrees centigrade. This also has a pressure of 1 MPa, and the temperature is uh, 80 degrees centigrade. Okay, We are told the mass flow rate of the cold stream is twice that of the hot one. OK, so Mi2 is equal to 2 Mi1. 
and we're using flow rates so we need to make sure that we use uh, Newtonian nutition and what else do we know well we know that mi2 plus mi1 is equal to me dot right because in other words the mass coming in the two masses coming in have to equal the mass going out um, so since this value is this, we can write 2 mi dot 1 plus mi dot 1 is equal to me dot. Or 3 mi 1 is equal to me dot. All right, so that just gives us a mass balance. Okay, we know what the relationship is between those two. Um, let's see, stream at this, just a second, All right, um, so we have this stream and we have that stream and we have that. Determine the temperature and quality on exit. Temperature equals what? Quality equals what? All right. So this is sort of a problem that uh, we have to accept on faith because if you look at it, it really doesn't look like we're going to be able to um, to do anything with this uh, right off the bat, is there? Now, if we take a look at a mixing chamber, and I was really, I'm sorry to say this, I'm almost ready to, this is actually a steady flow problem, and I would like to do a uniform flow problem because what happens is once the mixing chamber flows full, I'm just gonna talk about this a minute and then I'm gonna pick a different problem. Once you fill the mixing chamber, there's no DECVDT or DMCVDT. The other thing is, is that we have a pressure of one MPA and a pressure of one MPA. That means that the exit pressure is going to be very near one MPA. So if you do an energy balance on this, it's really gonna be a steady flow energy balance. Um, and that is not what I wanted to do. So I'm going to change and do a uniform flow problem if I can find a good one here. Okay, so charging and discharging. Let's do this. Um, I'm either going to do 5, 111 or 112, depending on what I've assigned for homework. So I'm going to take a look at the Moodle page. Five, one, okay, so I'm going to do 5, um, I'll go ahead and do 5, 112, because there's a picture that goes with that. All right, so on to 112, what we have here is a charging uh, or a discharging process. Charging just means that you're adding volume to a control volume. Discharging means you're withdrawing, so that the overall mass at time 2 in a charging process is greater than the mass at time one. So if we read problem 5112, we see that we have a two cubic meter rigid insulated tank. That means that the volume is two cubic meters. When it says insulated, that is another key word for there is no heat transfer. So the Q, uh, it's the same as adiabatic in that system. Q out of that system is equal to zero. It says where it's saturated water vapor, so that means X is equal to one. The pressure is one MPA. This is initially. We have a valve and a flow line of steam. Right? And the connected to a valve supply line that carries steam at 400 degrees centigrade. All right, now the valve is opened and steam is allowed to flow slowly into the tank until the pressure rises to 2 MPA. So the pressure over here at state 2, this is state 1, this is state 2, pressure over here is 2 MPA. At this instant, the tank temperature is measured to be 300 degrees centigrade. Determine the mass of the steam that has entered and the pressure of the steam in the supply line. All right, so 
Here we have a situation where our mass is obviously not the same. In other words, we start with one mass, which we can actually determine. But let's do the, the mass balance. The mass at time one plus the mass that enters is equal to the mass at time two. All right. Now, we can find the mass here. We have a volume since it's a rigid tank. The volume remains unchanged from beginning to end. We have a pressure and temperature at the end at time two. And we have a uh, pressure and of the fact that we're at an X of one means that it's saturated. So the temperature is going to be saturated temperature here. So we have this equation laid out. We're going to have to find some variables from this. We're going to have to find specific volumes, which we can find both of those. All right. And then we're going to be able to find out uh, something about the mass that enters, but not quite yet. The next thing we need to do is to set up the first law of thermodynamics for a uniform flow system. So some of the words that they used where it says it happens at this instant, that means that things don't get to cool down. Um, it also says that it happens slowly, meaning that it happens in a fashion that we can talk about the endpoints and the stuff that entered. So from, once again, page 251, the, uh, for a uniform flow problem, this is our material balance equation. The mass in minus the mass out is equal to the change in mass in the system, which just comes out to this because we don't really have any mass out. And the first law of thermodynamics uh, looks like this. Let me see if I can get that out of there. There we go. Uh, plus the quantity M2U2 minus M1U1 in the system. All right. Now, the first thing is when we look at this equation, we're told that this is insulated. So this is equal to 0. We're also told it's a rigid tank. There's no work being done because the tank is not expanding or contracting. We don't have anything going out at all, and we have a single inlet. So the equation reduces to uh, 0 is equal to m in h in plus the quantity m2 u2 minus m1 u1. Okay. So we can find what our masses are at time one and time two and use this equation to find the amount of mass that came in. Then we can plug that in here and we'll be able to solve for H in at which point, because we know that the steam is at 400 degrees, we'll be able to define the state and find that pressure. So let's get started. The first thing that we need to do is to find our U values and our V values. So I need to find U1 and U2 as well as specific volumes because I know the actual volume or the extensive volume of that system. So going back to the podium PC, we pick up our steam tables. Or maybe this is it. Ha, ha, ha. There we go. And we're talking about steam. So it's water. And we are also talking about um, SI units. So we're in the right tables. State 2 is at uh, 300 degrees and 2 MPA. So I'm guessing that that is superheated. And I can see here that it is. Because this table, 2 MPA, temperature 300, we are clearly superheated. So for state 2, my specific volume is 0.12551. And my U value is 2773.2. This is in kilojoules per kilogram. And this is in cubic meter per kilogram. So I've written the values right here. Just picked them up out of the table. All right. Now let's go back and define our state 1. I'm told that x is 100%. That means it has to be uh, saturated water. We're given a pressure of 1 MPA, which is 1,000 kPa. And because x is 1, that means that my properties are going to be the g values. So in other words, v sub g and 
u sub g. So v sub g is 0.19436 cubic meters per kilogram, and u sub g is 2582.8 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay. So now I have my data that I've written here and here. The first thing I can do, I need to find out how much mass entered. So the easiest way to do that is to find the mass in the tank at time 2, the mass in the tank at time 1, subtract them from each other, and I can find the amount of mass that entered. So basically, I know that um, if I have an intensive volume, intensive volume, extensive volume, that I can say mass at time 1 is equal to the volume divided by the specific volume, which here is 2 cubic meters divided by 0.19436 cubic meters per kilogram. These cancel kilogram flips up, so if I take 2 and I divide it by that specific volume, 2 divided by 0.19436. That my uh, mass in the tank at time one is 10.29 kilograms. I can do the same thing for state two. The mass at time two is going to equal the two cubic meters because it's a rigid tank. That volume has not changed at all. Divided by 0.12551. And that value is 15.93 um, kilograms. So I can see from this equation then, if I rewrite this, M2 minus M1 equals M that came in. So if I take uh, 15.93, which is my final mass, subtract off the initial mass, 10.29. That is going to give me the amount of mass that came in, in that flow line. And that value is 5.64 kilograms. So we now know that the mass that came in is 5.64 kilograms. And now we can work with this equation to find H in and along with 400 degrees centigrade, we can define the second state to find the, pr or to find the entrance state to find that pressure. So I get zero is equal to the mass that came in, 5.64 kilograms, times H in, which is my unknown, plus the mass at time two, which is 15.93 kilograms, times the U at time two, 2773.2, okay. I'm just looking to make sure my units are the same, which they are. Um, and then I get mass at time one, which is, and this is a negative, so it's minus 10.29 kilograms times the U at time one, which is 2582 .8. All my units work out. I just need to solve for H in. So that's going to be this number. Becomes a positive on this side. Minus this number. Uh, divided by 5.64. Okay, now I have something amiss here. I'm not really sure what it is because it looks to me like this number is definitely going to be a negative number. Oh, my MN is a negative. That's it. Do you see that? When, this should be negative right here. Okay, so when I do that and I bring this over, this becomes a negative like that. Okay, that would be the best way to place that number right there. 
Okay. So that means that this will be a negative, but this side will be a negative. So when I finish that, I'll have a negative equal to a negative. All right. So let's go ahead and do the little math here. We get um, 10.29 times 2, 2582.8. That number is 26577 minus 15.93 times 27732.2 um, 44177 divided by 5.64 equals negative HN. So this number is negative minus 20 or plus 26.52677 divided by 5.64 and so this value turns out to be negative 3120.58 that's negative hn so that means hn is 3120.58 units are going to be kilojoules per kilogram. All right, so now I have two of the state variables. I know that my H value on the inlet stream is this. I know that my temperature on the inlet stream is 400 degrees centigrade. So I need to go into my tables and find what steam looks like um, at that under those conditions. So. I'm going to start by assuming, am I going to assume because I have a pressure? No, I have a, a temperature of 400. Okay, so let's come up here into the two phase tables at 400 degrees centigrade. Yeah, see it doesn't even go up to 400, does it, for steam. So what that means is I'm probably superheated. What's that? Are you good? Okay. Um, 400 degrees centigrade. I want to come over to my H values at, at 400 and it's kind of an interpolation, not interpolation, but I have to, it's kind of weird because the tables are organized by pressure. But my value is 3120. coming down, but it's coming down pretty slow. 3178. Here, this is very close, isn't it? What about over here at 8? Yeah, this is very, very close. Here's my H value. The H value I calculated was 3120. This value is 3118.8. So I'm going to call that close enough, right? That means that my pressure is right at 9 MPA in that flow line. Um, that's based on H equals 3118.8, okay? So, in other words, if you look here, I picked up that value. Mine was actually 3120. This one is 3118, so it's off very slightly. But I could interpolate, but it's just going to be slightly below 9 MPA. Okay? Do you guys have any questions about that? This is a really good problem. I wish I would have picked it out right at first, but it's a really good problem because you have to kind of, have you know, you look at a problem and you really can't see that all the data is going to come out of that problem. You know, all of the answers are going to come out of the equations. But if you just write them down in the proper form, eliminate the, the factors that are not relevant, you, you come out with everything that you need. All right? So that's it for Chapter 5. Uh, all of the homework is posted, so get started on that. It won't be due till next week. I have the date posted on the Moodle page. But when we come back on Thursday, we'll get started with Chapter 6.